Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Look us up on Roku. We're in the sports section, Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, for the last few days, I've been on a short vacation. A uh, good friend of mine uh, is turning 50. And so I've been out of town. Right now I'm in a hotel room, right? But of course, it's when you leave town that big things happen, like Kell Brook against Sean Porter, like a bunch of other stuff. What I'm going to do is talk about two boxing stories, then let's discuss that Kell Brook-Sean Porter fight. I'll take you through my night. That fight was great for me, obviously. The, po the pre-fight video here is online. But um, realistically, before that fight, I lost a match involving uh, Durrell versus Saki Obika. So understand, my night had ups and downs. You're catching me early in the morning after I've just watched the Kell brook Sean Porter fight on tape. Okay, now let's talk about just a couple of things quickly in boxing, then we'll dive into the fight. A viewer here online alerted me to the fact that the Floyd Mayweather-Marcus Maidana fight is uh, actually also going to be for the 154-pound title. Now, to everyone, the WBC's 154-pound title. Now, to everyone who was outraged that Rod Salka got a shot at the 140-pound title, in fact, he didn't, right? The outrage was so great that they actually denied Rod Salka his shot at the title. Right For everyone who was sanctimonious then in talking about rankings and what a guy has done on the world stage in his weight class, then I hope you're outraged by the very thought of Marcus Maidana somehow fighting for the WBC title at 154 pounds. That's a joke, folks. What's Marcus Maidana done at 154? He's fighting at 147. Understand, when you allow champions to keep their belts, in this case Floyd Mayweather at 154, by fighting guys who aren't even in that weight class and have done nothing at that weight class and who don't even currently hold belts, right? Keep in mind, Maidana lost to Mayweather at 147, right? Maidana doesn't hold the belt. You mean to tell me the sanctioning body is going to call that a title fight at 154? No, let's get real here. That's a title fight at 147, not 154. Unless people can name the guys at 154 who Marcus Maidana beat, then he doesn't belong in a title fight for the WBC title at 154. Quite frankly, I think it even hurts Mayweather's legacy because when we talk about title defenses, let's make sure they're real title defenses. If you're going to deny Rod Salka a shot at the title, how are you giving Marcus Maidana a shot at the title at 154? Let's move to the next issue, right? Of course I leave town, and then I hear that a great guy, a former client of mine, has been sued by a promoter, and I'm deliberately not using names here, for millions of dollars supposedly for defamation, right? God forbid my former client actually publicly stated that uh, he felt he was a victim of Muhammad Ali Act violations, right? That upset folks so much that they have sued him for millions of dollars for defamation. Just understand, anyone can bring a lawsuit. You, me, next door neighbor, hotel guest here can bring a lawsuit. The bringing of a lawsuit doesn't mean that that lawsuit will prevail or is even meritorious. Let me make a few other points, too. For those of you interested in defamation law, right? People know I'm based in California, right? California Civil Code Section 47 can easily be Googled here online, right? What you'll find out is really statements made in court are privileged. They really can't serve as the basis for a defamation claim, right? There's a very high hurdle to remove that privilege. Let me go one step further. The Muhammad Ali Act has enforcement provisions, right? No 
athlete who believes that they aren't getting full disclosure of their finances in accordance with that act should be afraid to bring a claim under that act. Now, restating the penalty provisions of the Muhammad Ali Act to a member of the press is not defamatory. It's literally just talking about the provisions of a written statute. Let me also point out, too, that, again, for those of you interested in defamation law and who are reporting on this lawsuit, just understand the promoter in question is a public figure. Right? You're going to have to show malice here if you're going to try to collect damages for defamation. Right? Um, come on. Understand the existence of any correspondence predating the lawsuit that shows any concern by the fighter about the level of financial disclosures he has received, quite frankly, would negate any type of showing for malice, right? If the fighter truly believes that they have not received full financial disclosure, then I believe it's almost impossible to prove that that fighter is bringing up a lawsuit and then commenting on the penalty provisions of the Muhammad Ali Act, a written statute, can ever rise to the legal standard of malice. Let me also say, too, that if the fighter can show any non-disclosure or non-compliance with the Ali Act, just understand that if there's non-compliance, then you have truth as a defense, right? Finally, I know there are big reputation lawyers out there. By the way, a big reputation doesn't necessarily connote effectiveness, right? Well, let me just say this. Big reputation lawyers only go so far, right? Because they can't rewrite the statutes. They can't change the law. I'm always amazed when I'm in court and someone with a big reputation really is talking about things that are easily contradicted by case law and by statute, right? So just keep that in mind. Uh, I understand that's in the news. Lord knows I've gotten some messages here online about all of that. Now let's talk about the fight. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually put in the description to this video talk of Kell Brook Sean Porter fight starts at 720 on this video. Let's talk about the fight. Now my pre-fight video is up here online. In that pre-fight video, I said Kell Brook was mispriced, right? He was a plus 190 when I looked at the uh, odds. I understand he went up to a 2-1 to one underdog, right? He was a big underdog in this fight. This would allow you to hedge the play and to actually get, you know, even money back, right? Because you're getting 2-1 to one on the Kell Brook side of the play. So I hope a lot of people watching this video have a lot more money in their pocket. Now, yesterday, while I was at my friend's party, I was seated at the bar, and I had a uh, little tablet with me. And, of course, I was not watching the fight live. I was looking at the comments to my video, which everyone can look at here online. And, of course, people were saying, hey, this is an outrage. Right? This is an outrage. Sean Porter got robbed. Right? The feeling was that, you know, Sean Porter was the more energetic fighter that Kell Brook did a lot of holding. One person said to me, Dwyer, you criticized Vladimir Klitschko for holding Alexander Povetkin. Right? I hope you criticize Kell Brook for holding Sean Porter. Now let me just say, I thought Kell Brook not only won the fight, I thought Kell Brook dominated the fight. Right? As I look at Kell Brook, I keep thinking back and keep in mind, I'm older, according to YouTube, than many of my subscribers here online. I keep thinking back to an old Colt 45 malt liquor tagline, right? They had a commercial involving Billy D. Williams, and the tagline for Colt 45, and remember, it's a malt liquor, was don't let the smooth taste fool you, right? When you look at Kell Brook, understand, this guy is high level, right? Do yourself a favor as you're looking at the fight, right? Don't be fooled by the body language of the fighters. Just understand that I, uh, you know, I get that Sean Porter fights hot. In other words, he's in there, right, and he's energetic. You see the effort. 
He is explosive. He's the one pushing the action. He's moving, right? You understand his energy level. It's high. Then you got Kell Brook. Kell Brook's a bit more complicated, right? Kell Brook almost looks like he's doing his taxes, right? He looks a little bit distracted. He looks a little bit bored. He's calm. He's cool in the ring. He's not hot. He's cool. Right? But understand, that body language doesn't tell you who's landing punches. Sean Porter has a lot of energy, but he's missing punches. His punches are wide. When he comes in, Kel Brook, the guy who looks like he's doing accounting work, is actually landing the shorter, cleaner, crisper punches. Right? That's the trend throughout the fight. Also, when Porter comes in, Keep in mind, Kelbrook often doesn't hold Porter until he lands a couple of clean shots. Porter's head snaps back several times in this fight. Right? I thought Kelbrook was controlling it. Now let's talk about the mistakes Porter made. Now I think Porter has a great corner, but I'm going to disagree with Porter's corner on a few things. Number one. If you get inside and the guy keeps holding you, you've got to draw the attention of the fans and the judges to who's holding who. The way to do that, really, is if you don't have a free hand to actually continue punching, because continuing to punch is always your best choice when you're close inside, right? And the other guy can't hit you right but short of that you should push your hands apart make sure everyone understands you're not holding the reason why the action is truncated is because the other guy is holding you right Sean Porter didn't have that showmanship part showtime didn't have that showmanship element of his game let me also say too that Porter is shorter than Brooke right but Porter didn't leverage that by bouncing. Now, Porter used to bounce when he was younger. Here, Porter pretty much stays upright, right? He's lower than Brook, but he doesn't really bounce at all, right? And I believe that taking away the vertical part of his game hurt him. In other words, he's throwing wide shots. I believe Cal Brook could tell when he was coming up top with wide shots. Right? There's no kind of rhythm break there where, you know, Cal Brook would have to deal with a Joe Fraser dynamic of a guy who looks like he's on a mattress spring from low down. Right? Let me also say, too, Sean Porter is two handed, but sometimes two handed fighters should go one handed. Right? Now, if Cal Brook is grabbing you repeatedly, and is able to literally get inside of you, right? You're going to notice Kelbrook grabs Porter, who's broad-chested, right? And Porter's hands are always on the side, you know, on the sides, right? Maybe what Porter should have done is tried to split the uprights instead. Come in, throw a jab to the body. Throw punches at the middle of Kelbrook. Not winging shots up top not winging shots to the side that Kelbrook can step inside of and then grab you. It's harder to grab a man who's throwing jabs to the body, right? And I like that jab to the body because you're still somewhat protected, right? Or uppercuts if you want to get more reckless and actually step in and have a lot of leverage on shots. Understand what that does is as Kelbrook comes to grab you, he's getting hit to his body then he's going to have to start to defend his body. That would leave him vulnerable to the outside shots, right? I don't think Sean Porter threw jabs to the body enough. I don't think Sean Porter worked the body enough in a way that didn't require, require him to throw winging shots. I mean, the secret on this fight's the angles, right? Cal Brook is throwing short, crisp punches. He's hitting Porter on the way in, right? One of the beauty 
one of the beautiful things with Brook is he doesn't have to wind up a lot to get power on shots. So he's throwing nice short punches. Porter, by contrast, is throwing wide angle punches. Now, wide angle might work on camera shots, right? It doesn't work in boxing, right? So I thought Brook, excuse me, I thought Porter throughout was a bit too wide. Let me just say, too, an interesting moment in this fight takes place early as the fighters are trying to, you know, uh, mark their territory, so to speak. With 123 left in the first round, you're going to notice a big moment in the fight. Porter gets Brook in the corner, right? So you're thinking, okay, great. Porter, who's kind of like Mike Tyson, has Brook where he wants him. So then you think to yourself, okay, well, what's Porter going to do next? Is he going to keep Brook in the corner, right? Have Brook running into his shoulder and then go to town on Brook's body and slow down Brook. Or is he going to let Brooke out of the corner? He not only lets Brooke out of the corner, but I would argue that the best combination of that first round, and I'm naming the first round because it's easy to watch. I'm not asking you to forward the tape too far in. The best combination of the first round are the last two punches of the first round. They're delivered by Kel Brook. Right? Kel Brook is able to pretty much move around the ring where he wants to move, right? He's not Pauli Malinashi. He's moving around the ring where he wants to move, and even though he looks, you know, smooth, right? As I said, don't let the smooth taste fool you. Look at the last two punches of the round. I would argue that there's some acting going on there. Porter gets hit flush. Then Porter goes to his corner, and it looks to me like Porter is a little off balance, right? In other words, these short punches Kel Brook is throwing are landing, and they're hurting, right? That's the pattern throughout the match. Let me point out, too, that Brook doesn't throw a lot of jabs in the fight, right? He also keeps his timing. In other words, what ever Sean Porter is doing Brook doesn't get dragged into it the fight doesn't become one big slop fest it's not Kel Brook deciding to throw his construct out and just trying to out muscle Sean Porter he never does that the entire fight he's surgical in hitting Porter as he comes in Right? He also can lead with power shots, and make no mistakes, Kel Brook is throwing home run shots at times that miss Porter. Kel Brook is trying to lead with left hooks. Right, Other times he tries to lead with right hooks. Right, I love that stuff, because keep in mind, when you're fighting a counterpuncher, you don't want to disclose too much of your pattern. You don't want the counterpuncher to figure out exactly when you're going to throw power punches. One of the problems I have with Manny Pacquiao, for example, is he has to kind of touch you a little with his right hand before he throws that big left. Right? Fighters with that kind of tell are giving away the playbook before the play. Here, you're going to notice Kell Brook is high level. He's leading with the bad intention power punches, right? And so a few times you're going to notice Porter, who is above average defensively, skillfully ducking under some huge shots being thrown by Kell Brook. Now, don't get confused with Kell Brook's facial expression, right? Kell Brook's a guy who always looks bored. He never looks excited. That doesn't mean he's not doing exciting things. Right? Let me just point out, too, the ninth round. Let's jump ahead. 50 seconds left in the ninth round. That about sums up the fight for me. Right? Porter's aggressive. He's trying to be as aggressive as possible. The punches are too wide. Right? He's missing. I know many people here online think Porter won the fight. 
he's missing a lot of shots. His energy isn't resulting in hard shots. Now watch Cal Brook. Cal Brook looks smooth, right? Looks like he's in an early 70s movie, right? You know, he's walking around, he's looking smooth. He outmaneuvers Porter in those last 50 seconds of the ninth round. And then, of course, he lands his own shots, right? In other words, Porter is the guy who is all active and stuff like that. But the punches are flying by you. Kel Brook is the guy who looks like he's asleep, but yet he's landing shots repeatedly. I thought Brook won this fight by at least four rounds, right? I think Kel Brook is going to give whoever he fights a lot of trouble. Let me point out, too, the tip-off on Kel Brook. Understand that Kel Brook used to spar with Amir Khan. Now, you need to know that fact because, understand, had these two men, even before this fight, fought in the UK, it would have been guaranteed box office. This would have been kind of like David Hay against Derek Chisora, right? The tickets would have sold out in about two minutes. Now, if you're Amir Khan and Kell Brooks, your former sparring partner, and if you know, as Khan claims, Right? And let's remember, Khan predicted Porter would win this fight. Right? Don't underestimate the political agenda of fighters. Right? If you're Amir Khan and you feel that you've dominated this guy in sparring, as Khan claims, then why wouldn't you get the payday, get the prize, right? Beat your former sparring partner on your home soil. Wouldn't that be an opportunity you couldn't turn down? But yet, not only did Amir Khan not fight Kell Brook, but Amir Khan went further and said that the only way he would fight Kell Brook is if Kell Brook had a title. Now, we could package that story however we want, right? You know, one way to interpret it is to say Kell Brook is nothing, right? You know, he's not worth the, the match. But there's another interpretation. It's that, you know what, I've been in the ring with Kell Brook and I see the hand speed. I see the short punches. I see the fact that the guy hits hard, and he hits hard, folks. The guy hits hard without a wind-up. I see the fact that you didn't see it in this fight because Porter has great legs too, right? But if you're in the ring with Kell Brook, I get the feeling you realize Kell Brook is blessed with great foot speed, right? So Amir Khan may have realized, look, this is a difficult fight. That's a payday I'd have to earn. And I might not leave that fight the winner, right? So understand, for all the people out there in the United States saying, who's Cal Brook? Amir Khan knows who he is. That's why he hasn't fought him up until now. Right? Understand a lot is happening at Welter. Right? Floyd Mayweather has a full dance card if he wants it. If he doesn't, understand there is a mega, multi-million dollar fight between Cal Brook and Amir Khan if they want it. It's just a sign of the times in boxing that everyone talks about wanting these big fights, but we're not getting them. You know, the closest Keith Thurman has come to fighting these guys was sitting at the fight last night, right? He was there, right? Keith Thurman has a full dance card if he wants it. Folks, a lot is happening at 147 pounds. You have a new champion. A group of Englishmen came across the Atlantic, hopped on a plane, crossed the Atlantic, crossed the country, and then did a coup d'etat and are leaving with the IBF title. If you don't know who Kelbrook is by now, please pull up some videos. This man is dangerous, as I said. With regard to Kelbrook, don't let the smooth taste fool you. Right? Maybe the guy looks, you know, as I said, like he's doing his taxes in the ring. Right? The hand speed, the power the talent, 
it's obvious. And he's added a lot to his game since that first Carson Jones fight. He can now tie you up inside if you don't split the uprights and throw straight punches to the body. Let me hear from you. I know many of you are going to disagree. If you disagree, lay out your entire case here in the comment section to the video. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.